Welcome back to another episode of the Chats with Clark podcast. I'm your host, Joe Clark, and here at Chats with Clark, we don't do poppy intros. We get straight to the point. And the point today are two wonderful people who have traveled all over the world that are going to share amazing stories with us, Mason McKendrick and Rochelle D'Estasio. Rochelle, Mason, how are you both? Great to, great to have you here. Thanks for being here. Yeah, of course. Doing Thanks great, doing us. great. Thanks for having us. It's good to be back here in the motherland, Cleveland, Ohio. Very excited. We're lucky to have you. Mason and I have been trying to make this happen for a long time, and there's just something different about being online as opposed to being in person, feeling the energy in the room, and being able to go back and forth here. So really glad you made it from New York and that you're here yes. celebrating Christmas. It's a pleasure. Definitely. Yes, thanks for having us. So why don't you two kind of just walk us through like who you are. Give us a little bit of what you do, where you're from, the background, and let's, mm-hmm. let's get to it. Yeah, so um, I was born here in Cleveland, in Menor, Ohio, and moved to New York about just under four years ago. But went to John Carroll, played football there, had a pretty good career, and that opened up the doors for me to be able to uh, sign an undrafted free agent contract with Baltimore Ravens. And then during that time, I signed a modeling contract as well. So that took me to New York and been living there, doing many different things like modeling, trying to get into the acting world, uh, personal training on the side, even bartended a little bit and um, just getting adapted to the big city over the few years. So it's been pretty exciting. That's wild. And I mean, those three years were full of a lot of crazy things that the world's not seen before. So yeah, roller coaster. You got thrown into the wolves. Definitely. Yeah. Great. Rochelle, how about you? So I was born in Palo Alto, California, raised in Nashville. Then I moved to New York when I was 14. And I signed a professional ballet contract with American Ballet Theater. And I danced coming for about five years. And then I, during our last season, during the Met, we were doing Sleeping Beauty and I got seriously injured and then I got scouted for modeling and I decided to go to the modeling route and I was traveling all over. I lived in London and all over Europe and then moved back to New York. So that's like kind of been my journey going from ballet into modeling and now acting. It's incredible how both of your stories have kind of have that similarity. Um, we were talking a little bit beforehand, like it, it points that are seemingly down, you manage to find great opportunities. And similar again, stories that at that down point, you guys emerge into a, right. what looks like to be future endeavors. So yeah. it's, it's quite fascinating. Yeah, it was definitely a, an interesting time. Uh, we met right before the pandemic, a, a week before the world shut down. Um, yeah, through mutual friends, and we hung out three times and decided to quarantine together and moved in, I think it was 10 days after uh, we yeah. first met, and then took on the whole pandemic together and haven't moved away from each other since. That's wild. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing, I mean, on such a short notice to be mm-hmm. able to do that. Yeah. 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 All right, so walk us through it, Mason. So you're at Carroll, and you're like, all right, you have bigger dreams. Like, you know you're going for the NFL. Yeah. You get that contract with the Ravens to potentially be part of the team. What does that look like for you? Yeah, so that was an incredible time. Um, I tell her all the time and brag about my time at John Carroll because it is truly such a special place. And uh, on my first day of my recruiting visit, you know, you can feel the energy. You can feel the magic in the air and everything like that. And sure enough, there was just opportunity after opportunity through Carroll. And um, that thankfully led me to the opportunity to go through the NFL draft process and all that good stuff. And so it opened up, I was able to sign the undrafted free agent contract with Baltimore. And that was a whole roller coaster of that time period where I signed the modeling contract during that same time. I'm trying to make it NFL weight, do all the things I needed to do to cross those uh, T's and dot those I's in the best position to start that career. Um, in the back of my head though, I always wanted to model coming in my freshman year of John Carroll. I said, by the time I'm a senior, I want to be training for the NFL and sign a modeling contract one way or another. And they both unfolded how they unfolded. I got messaged uh, that December before um, that draft in 2018. My manager reached out to me through Instagram on a limb and said, hey, you ever think about modeling? And Two days later, during finals week, I got flown out to New York and uh, booked a magazine editorial, and everything ended up being pretty legit with the modeling and stuff, because I wasn't sure in the beginning, because it was kind of a sketchy message where there wasn't too much context to it, you know? And so I went out there, I told, I come from a family of six kids, so I told one of my sisters that I was going just in case something were to happen, somebody knew. And... My parents weren't aware of it or anything, but 
I came back and I told them, I said, let me tell you this opportunity that happened that <laughs> can be something really special, yeah. you know? And so during that time, I signed the contract. I went out for Fashion Week that uh, February during that time too, and more things unfolded, more possibilities came about. And I ended up going through the draft process as well. My agency that I signed with in the beginning, I'm still with them and they stuck it with me through that whole process. Um, told me, run your route, do what you need to do, and we'll be here when you're ready to come back and model it. So that was very special um, to have that support yeah. from these people that I just met, you know? It's some commitment right there. Yeah, it really is. yeah, and especially when I got up to 230 pounds, because there's not a lot of modeling gigs at that <laughs> weight, they were a little scared. Yeah. And they're like, oh, is he gonna be able to come back and do it? But everything worked out. And um, the opportunity at the Ravens, uh, ran its course. I was signed on, went to rookie camp. After rookie camp, uh, there was a little miscommunication. I was told I was coming in to play safety, so I was 210. Um, they put me at inside linebacker, and I needed to be 230 for that. So I was definitely undersized, but I held my own. Um, but they released me after that camp and told me it'd be 230 in July when they called me back. So I went home, I gained 20 pounds in 12 days, and I was 230 when they, 233 when they called me. Okay. Yeah, back in July. But they said there was a situation where it was going to be when somebody gets injured or gets cut, then they were going to call me back to bring me in. But at that point, I was hungry for the next opportunity. Instead of essentially waiting for somebody to fail to get that opportunity, I wanted to see what else is out there. What other impact can I put on this world, you know, and, yeah. and uh, different adventures I can go after. And it's admirable, really, too. Yeah, obviously. It was definitely a scary, scary jump, for sure. So what, how did you know like the difference between every kid saying I want to be in the NFL, I want to be in the NBA, I want to be a pro mm -hmm. sports player, and like you saying I can do this? Mm -hmm. like, how did you know that there was a difference there between you and then the next guy in line who was like eh. um, I, That's a great question. I would, I would give a lot of credit to my parents um, and their continuous belief in me because there's twice in my life that I almost quit football, once in 10th grade and once in at the end of high school because I wasn't even going to play in college you know I was going to go to Ohio University and be a frat star <laughs> and party a little bit you know that was dream man yeah that was, <laughs> uh, that was what I was debating on because my senior year I fractured my hip actually in high school so all the D1 opportunities and stuff like that quickly evaded and so I was like well what's the point what's the point of going like that was my dream to go to the NFL if I'm not going D1 then there's no chance you know and so my parents pushed me to go <clears throat> visit a few schools and we didn't go to many you know we only did maybe five visits okay. and thank thankfully John Carroll was one of those yeah. and as soon as I stepped foot on this campus told my dad afterwards like one way or another I, I'm coming here you yeah, know like there's an opportunity here the coaches at the time and it were unbelievable talented. I mean, you can see where they're all at today in the NFL and uh, spread out throughout the NFL league. And some are still here and handling their adventures and stuff like that. But there's a time that, you know, you look at the competition around you and you see, okay, what can stand out? And as more opportunities come, you set these goals for yourself. And as you're obtaining these goals and more things are clicking, it's like, okay, well, things are starting to fall into place. And that buzz really came into fruition after my sophomore year going into my junior year um, where the opportunity I started getting some notability of okay maybe this guy can make the jump from yeah. three to the NFL so I'm very thankful for the continuous push from my parents and the coaches that we had here during my time really opened up that athleticism to knowledge combination that you need to take it to the next level and put me in the right position to be able to make those plays that put me on the map right wow it's incredible and I would imagine like there's a certain sense of diligence that is required to play at such a high level to compete at such a high level and it seems to me that if you're going to do anything at a high level you're probably going to need that so to yeah. learn that from football to be able to correlate that over to your modeling active yeah. career seems like an important job really yeah definitely and that's a huge part because it's you know that self self-confidence and carrying that with you and that mentality of like I have to perform at a high level and keep it up and it really allows you to understand the wins and the losses and learning in both of them and um, one of my coaches from that time Brandon Staley 
he always said don't ride the wave of emotion you know when you're on your highs don't get too high on it and when you're on your lows don't stay down too low always be consistent in the middle of it and that allows you to detach yourself from the ups and downs and remain consistent in your work and be diligent in your training and stuff like that so with the modeling world when you get all these no's 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 it's not you you're able to stay in that frame of mind like look i'm i know i can compete i know yeah. i can do this it's just getting that opportunity to be put in the right place at the right time that's amazing and for anyone that's listening that doesn't know that is a playoff coach mm -hmm. this is a coach that's not walking in the playoffs as of last night yep yep he clinched in the NFL. yeah yeah it's incredible he's the head coach of the los angeles chargers now mm -hmm. so when you when you decided okay like i'm not going to take the opportunity to go back to the ravens in mm -hmm. july and you decided I'm going to focus strictly on the modeling career. How did your efforts shift? I mean, naturally, you're done with the football. You scrap it. You wipe that clean. Yeah. But then how do you say you call back at your people from before and mm -hmm. say, like, you know what? Let's give it a go. What does yeah. that look like? How do you how do you even go about that? Yeah. So, um, like I was mentioning, you know, I was 230 and they're a little nervous yeah. if I was going to – what I was going to be able to do because they had some big plans for me that it wasn't just going to be a fitness model because there's all these different categories in the modeling industry and stuff like that. So, you have, like – your fitness, your high fashion, your runway, all this stuff. And at first they were talking like, look, we have this big plan for you that you can do a lot of stuff in this industry. And then once I got that size, it was like, okay, maybe now he'll just be a fitness model or whatever. So um, I called them and told them that. And thankfully enough, I got assigned. It was two days after I made that decision that I got called out for an Under Armour campaign. So I was... I immediately got a job, so that was refreshing, like yeah. taking this big risk, how long of a process is it going to be until I get that opportunity, and it ended up being two days, and I was, out, yeah, <laughs> and so I was like, okay, that's reassuring, but I was 2.30 at that time, you know, I was wearing, wearing hoodies, fleeces, mm -hmm. all their workout stuff for the winter, um, which was pretty insane, because we were shooting at in 96 degree weather in July, oh <laughs> yeah, in New York, so that was interesting, but you gotta, I put myself in a frame of mind because I really break down my life into four year processes. So you look through high school, four years, you look through college, four years, you know, and you have the first year, even coming to John Carroll, my dad laid out a system of goals to obtain. You know, first year you learn the system. Next year you wanna make special teams, travel roster, get some playing time where you can. Third year you wanna be a role player. Senior year you wanna be that starter, you know. And I told my dad I had a little different plan for that time schedule <laughs> and fast forwarded a little bit. But I always look at my life in that situation. I told him, first year I want to learn the system, but I want to be playing. You know, so when I go into modeling the first year, I want to learn how the industry works, learn how everything X's and O's work and all that. But I want to be shooting. I want to be working. I want to be doing it as I learn. And nice. Yeah. So then the second year, you're a little more comfortable and you kind of got the rhythm of it a little bit. And then the third year, you're really... Uh, you're out there. Yeah, you're out there. You're doing things that you're, you're working towards and uh, goals are being accomplished and stuff like that. And then that fourth year, you're able to enjoy the process as it's coming into fruition. So it's really like, okay, I just got signed by the NFL. That four-year process just worked the way I wanted it to work. Now how do I do that by being a freshman again in this industry? Yeah, and it just really allows you to take a step back and be a sponge with learning everything that goes into it. What a great analogy. Yeah, the sponge analogy is awesome. Any yeah. knowledge that you can take in and then be able to like super back out is, yeah. is powerful. Mm -hmm. It's great. And Rochelle, walk us through, how do you become such an excellent ballerina? What, like this is a world, I gotta be honest with you, I have no idea about, right? Like, <laughs> Don't worry, I didn't either yeah. <laughs> until Just we like, met. Yeah. So, I mean, you're one of the best ballerinas in the world at that time. I mean, um, you probably still are, but at that time. So, basically, I knew, like, I always wanted to dance. I did play almost, like, every sport. Like, my mom, okay. like, really gave me the opportunity to be, like, you can do whatever you want. We can sign you up for gymnastics, soccer, basketball, volleyball. I was captain awesome. of my volleyball team and when I was in high school. Um, like, I literally tried every sport, and I always went back to ballet. Like, I, like that's where my love always was. Yeah. Like, I didn't feel the same passion and drive like I did with ballet. So my mom had put me in classes like when I first started when I was three years old okay. and I'm like, you know, creative dance, whatever. And then I, you know, wanted to pursue it more of a career. And my, I told my mom when I was young, I think I was like 10 or 12, but I was like, I'm going to dance with American Ballet Theater. And that's like, it's like, if you go to college, like, oh, I'm going to go to Harvard. 
like okay. I'm gonna go to Yale, I'm gonna book the biggest job, like whatever, like the top yeah. of the list. And that is like the hardest company to get into. It's like number one in the world, um, next to like um, like Royal Ballet Academy and stuff like in London. And so then we, my mom's like, okay, well, we're gonna have to move to New York City and you know train and if you wanna pursue that next career. And so we ended up moving when I was 14 to New York. Um, and then I was at the summer intensive for School of American Ballet, which is New York City Ballet School, which is a balancing technique school, which is also another really big company. And then I just kind of went up the ladder then I auditioned for the American Valley Theater's like school like the JKO school and I got into the summer intensive on a full ride and then I ended up getting into the studio company which is the second company Tash the Main Company and that's how you kind of go through the company at age like 16 oh so I was like one of the youngest that yeah. got into the company and that was like my first job because we get paid like a stipend like five hundred dollars like nothing crazy yeah. but that was like I had never worked like a regular job before it's a different feeling when you get paid for doing stuff like, you love like ever yeah. like yeah. I never like worked like a, a bartending like waitressing none You're of that 16? because yeah, yeah I was 16 <laughs> like I just like we moved like I was 14 you know I was still in school like, yeah. I graduated I graduated when I was like right when I turned 16 so like I finished school like really early because wow. I did everything online. So okay. I was at a private school and then I transferred to academics all online because when you're moving it's just easier that way. And I just didn't have time for like my schedule it just didn't work out that way to go into school. And so and then people always like, oh well you miss prom like you never had your prom like well I get prom every day because I'm dancing with men all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like always joking like I'm always dancing like yeah. I I go to prom all the time or whatever. So I definitely like missed I always like reminisce and like think about like, oh I wonder what that would have been like to go to like a like regular school go to prom go to college just stuff a sweaty like that. gym yeah, yeah just, just you know sweaty, just a sweaty, sweaty gym nice. you know get something out of the punch like hopefully it's right. spiked whatever yeah um but I don't know so it, I think it was just like insane like just the process of like getting into a big company at such a young age and then sure. I got into the main company when I was 17 and then I got offered a contract with Dresden, which is one of the biggest companies in, in Germany, the Dresden Ballet. I got offered a solo's position, which is the second highest position in the company that you can get. And that was the time when I, um, like right three months before I got injured, when I was still with ABT. And because that's when they told me that I was gonna be too tall for the company. And because I was like literally the tallest, I was like five nine at the time. And everyone there that they had brought into the company was like five six, five seven. And so they told me the beginning of med season and we have three months there. And so it's like knowing I wasn't going to get a contract going back. I'm like, literally, it was like the worst, like literally working yeah. so hard. No, I'm not going to come back, dance for this company. And so and then literally like a, like the last two weeks, same thing with Mason that asked him to come back. Like the director of the company called me in for a meeting like, hey, actually, like you've been working so hard. We think that you'd be such a perfect fit to stay at ABT. Like we really want you to stay here. I was like. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I was like, thanks, but no thanks. I just like at that point, it just didn't feel it didn't feel the right fit for me to be there. Yeah. At that point, even though I had already accomplished, I was at ABT. Like I was able to work with um, Baryshnikov, like the biggest names in the ballet industry. You know, I fulfilled my dream. I danced in front of hundreds of thousands of people. That's amazing. I traveled the world, went to Royal. You know, I did all of that, and I was just like very grateful. And then I ended up getting injured the last week of that season during Sleeping Beauty. And so that's when that during the same time I got scouted by IMG and Wilhelmina Models. And I knew that was my when I was younger and I was fourteen when I first moved. I knew that was my other dream I wanted to pursue yeah. other than dance and acting as well. But I knew I, I had to pursue ballet first because that's more of a timeline you have to train like when you're super young it, there's more of a sure. scheduled time frame to get your goal of what you want to achieve so yeah that's pretty much how like, i'm here now and yeah. modeling and acting and there's something like you kind of feel slighted almost like it's an awesome opportunity when they're like oh we're gonna call you back and they do call you back you've been working hard you're great yeah. Fit. yeah but you kind of feel like it's it's almost like backhanded doesn't it yeah. like feel yeah and i think it's it, it luckily you know, I think it, it was a blessing to kind of be able to be exposed to that where it could be a slighted feeling too, but it also shows you that there's a lot more that goes into it that's out of your control. So like, 
all these athletes that go through the process that have this opportunity of you know reaching the highest level of their respected sport there's a lot that goes into it that's out of your control there was two scouts that told me i was going to play safety to show up i'm a linebacker well that's out of my control you yeah. know yeah and it's kind of you have to risk what to believe in and what to think that is kind of like smoke and mirrors mm -hmm. and during that time learning that it shows you well that happens in almost every industry that you come across to in everybody's life you know no matter what job it is there's always politics involved you know there's always somebody at the top there's always somebody telling somebody this is what we think is best you know so it kind of helps you compartmentalize the rejection or that negative connotation of uh you know we think so but maybe not today you yeah know? so it helps you take that back in look it's not me making all these mistakes it's not my lack of effort my lack right. of drive you know some things are out of your control and you know we believe that there's a plan for everybody and sometimes you're not ready for that plan to come into fruition and maybe you need to learn something or two before you're ready to get that yes mm -hmm. you know so it kind of helps you with the mental part of it for sure yeah it's great I mean, you both have excellent experiences that you now can have you are sharing right now and have this like your bolstering facts before you dive into the other part that you both said you had wanted as 14 year old young yeah. kids coming into carol like you have multiple dreams and so to be able to do one and then to say all right you know what it's time like time yeah. to hang up the cleats time to hang yeah. up the shoes the point shoes there we go okay <laughs> <laughs> the the every day. Yeah. see yeah. yeah it's perfect like yeah. that's awesome yeah. really yeah. Okay. so then you're both at a point right so you guys meet each other you're in new york you're doing this the world shuts down mm. tell us like I'm curious. Tell me about life when it's dead, because like all the stuff you see on TV or the pictures on like Twitter or whatever, it was yeah. like it looked like a ghost town. Yeah, like, Times Square, like no one there, like it as if there's ever not a person. It was. It yeah. was. I, um, yeah. Go ahead. Well, no, I was so I lived in this um, like really like luxury dorm building at the time, and I was on the 40th floor. So on from my view, you could see all the way down First Avenue, oh my gosh, and it yeah. was like completely empty, like yeah. just bare. All you would see would be like cop cars like driving around like six of them in a line just like yeah. literally seeing if it's almost like the perch like if yeah. anyone's on the streets I like you're going to prison or something you know like it was like they were literally just like searching to see if anyone was on the streets it was scary and then yeah. he would like go skateboarding like tell yeah. him you, you remember the old call of duty intro 400,000 people used to live here yes. that's a ghost town that's what it was like it yeah. was so eerie overnight like I give New York so much credit because of a, how many people live there yeah. how much we overnight. adapted to yeah. I think we did really well during the pandemic overnight like how big you know but yeah, yeah. yeah. there's so many people position. all the time like, right because it was yeah. overnight like everybody disappeared and I was calling people back home bragging about you know skating on one way roads the wrong way and they're like oh you're such you know you're so badass yeah you know? and I was like listen like you, you don't get do it you can't there. even skateboard like, on some sidewalks you know in some areas and it would take me what usually would take maybe 30 minutes to skate from one end to the other in New York. It was taking me 10 minutes, five minutes. There was no yeah. way. And it was truly interesting because back home, you know, my parents would see New York on the news and they were telling me that they were saying that there's bodies piled up on the sidewalks. Like Central Park was a morgue. And I told them, I was like, look, I said, it's not that. Yeah, they're like, we'll come get you. And I, I was like, listen, we, got, we ended up spending the first two months in that apartment. So yeah. it was, we like to say the whole world shut down for us to fall in love, you know? Oh, and uh, <laughs> but I told them, um, there's the dream guy, not the right, 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 right. <laughs> But I told them, I was like, uh, the only time you really saw the actuality of the pandemic was when you went to the grocery store. You know, people wouldn't even go down the same aisle as you, and you would be lined up outside the store to go in. And if you cough, forget about it. Everyone just giving you like yeah. a death look, like if you yeah. sneeze, oh my gosh. But it's yeah. a very eerie feeling, but uh, I give credit to everybody that lives in New York because it truly did yeah. decipate the whole yeah. population, you know, like yeah. on the streets and foot traffic, all that disappeared. So it was, it was very interesting, but we were there for the first two months and then moved down with my younger brother in Virginia and then we stayed with him. Uh, and for, then that was a culture shock for me. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, it was very <laughs> slow living. Yeah. The Nashville didn't uh, kick in. <laughs> no, because like Nashville is still more of a city compared to Virginia. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, it's just in Lynchburg. It's a very yeah, slow it's case. Very, yeah, but, but it was good. Did you guys get to model at all during this time? That was like um, a long time. Was, yeah, no, the whole industry pretty much shut down for like eight months. Yeah. Um, okay. And then there was... They have unemployment kick in. Yeah, because there, there wasn't anything to do. And that was the time where like 
influencers and stuff like that really started ramping up right, and right. opportunities with that really came into fruition and TikTok wasn't just this renegade dance party you know yeah. it was like wait we can monetize a lot of this stuff because you're so, big on TikTok right? Uh, she's pretty big on TikTok. Big on TikTok. I have to do a better job at TikTok. Got it. Okay. Yeah, I'm m- much more adamant about my posting on it. I would consider like I'm big because like some people say they're big. They have like millions. Like I have like 157,000. Yeah. But I feel like saying that like to some people that's really big. But I feel like when you say the word big in general, like it's yeah. usually people who have like a million, two million. Yeah. Yeah. But no, but 157,000. You can. You're making money. Yeah. It's still good. Yeah. Great, yeah. I it's haven't working. monetized it yeah. enough because right. I wasn't as proactive. But now like I've been mm-hmm. posting like every day. Yeah. Now I'm taking it more seriously because at first I was just like. I feel like it's just like a joke. Yeah, it was, time, it, it was yeah, <laughs> it was just like it was, or you're co- constantly trying to like compete to like who can dance or give the most full out like yeah. whatever, just something yeah. crazy, something to get all these views, yeah, you know. Right. But I think like when it comes to social media, it's like yeah. if you learn, go back to the basis of doing it because you love to do it and you're yourself, mm-hmm. you're gonna naturally gain the following and people who want to support you because they like you, not necessarily what you do all the time. Like it doesn't always have to be calculated. Like, right. Yeah. So mm-hmm. that's but, a great point. All right, so you're in Virginia, you're working on social media because you don't have modeling to do because yeah. the world shut down and you're cashing the unemployment. Yeah. Yeah. And then you end up going back to New York. Everything yeah. opens up, you go back to New York. What's that life like? We went to, that Cleveland, was, we went went to Cleveland for a week. It's okay. by here, yeah. July, we went back to New York. Because we were doing the TikTok and then I was also doing the commercial masonry with my younger brother because that's what he was doing at the time so went back to the blue collar days which was nice that's was, awesome. yeah it was yeah, a good reset yeah picking rock, uh, bricks up and putting them down you know <laughs> cutting grass doing all that good stuff but when we that's went good. back to new york that it was one probably even crazier shock than oh, when things wow. shut down because then it was like okay what's everybody's comfortability level what what is oh, the yeah. new normal all the restaurants were outdoor dining um I was bartending at the time, and then she got a bartending job with me uh, shortly after that. And then you go into the winter, and people are eating outside in like 15 degree weather. These little like plastic bubbles. Yeah, two feet of snow, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 So, I about that. yeah. That was so that brutal. was that was cool though because it kind of slowed down New York, and it gave okay. it like a European feel, especially during the summer. It was really cool. Um, yeah, it was nice because you know there wasn't as much traffic. Um, it was kind of wild. It was hard to find taxis at that time. This year it's been a little better, but before you would have to wait like a f- five minutes or something before you even see a taxi drive by. Yeah. Forget and about taking the subway. People thought taking the subway was like a death sentence just because it was on yeah. the ground because and yeah. the, everyone's close to each area. other. Yeah. yeah, but it was, again, the resiliency of New York is so impressive because of how many times we've just adapted. I mean, throughout the world yes but sure. how many times because in new york it's everything's accelerated you know so yeah, yeah. um watching everybody get back into the swing of things and being able to work that bartending job during that time was such a special experience because you know the rules and regulations were changing from week to week so it's like okay we can do this okay we can't do that all right we need a plastic shield right here okay we need one more foot pull this out way. the dividers yeah are they gonna come shut oh. us down tough, yeah. yeah and we were working at this brunch spot that you know we were probably serving 50 to 60 people each like in our respected sections at a time you know and Brutal. Yeah, tough. yeah it was just chaos and then jobs slowly coming back and the industry slowly coming back um because normally you would have anywhere from 10, 15, 20 people on big jobs on set to, okay, well now there's a couple people zooming in, seeing that everything's going well, and then you only have the photographer, maybe a stylist, and two, one to two other people. So it was a lot more um, intimate setting going back, coming yeah. out of the pandemic with that. It's compared. definitely very movie-esque. Yeah. Yeah. Very yeah. movie-like. Definitely. Do you guys like the New York feel? Do you feel like exhausted by it? Um, it can be exhausting. Or is it like kind of enlightening? Uh, it is. I think it's a balance and definitely yeah, right. being able to compartmentalize what you immerse yourself in. Um, one of the biggest difference from like coming from Cleveland compared to New York is you kind of have to schedule time to hang out with friends and stuff like that. Um, it, compared to being here in the college field, everybody sees each other every day. You know, it's just naturally like, okay, I went to class, now I'm going to go hang out, whatever. Yeah. And in New York, it's a, you might see a friend once or twice a month, you know, because everybody is on their schedule, doing their job, everything like that. So you have to really schedule time 
um, to be able to see people that you want to see. So it's but it still can be easy too because you do get around New York fairly easily. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know. I just like because I I lived in New York for twelve years now, and so it's yeah. like for me, if I'm anywhere for a long period of time, like I'm like I need to be rushing over there. Just have to get back yeah. there. It's like the energy is just like when you arrive and you see this like it's literally how it is in movies you instantly see the skyline of new york and you see like the empire state building and all the like the famous you know outline of all the buildings it just feels so magnetic and like exciting and eccentric which is like with how like the energy is immediately when you just like arrive it just feels different yeah and i don't know it just like kind of like fires you up just to like yeah. get after it it just yeah. new york has that energy where you just feel like it's a it's a good thing and bad thing because sometimes it makes you feel like you always have to be doing something or yeah, like you have this natural <laughs> FOMO like you're missing out yeah. on whatever is going on even though if there's really not anything going on because it's like the city that never sleeps yeah, right. so and that also counts like with us not having the best sleep schedule sometimes yeah, because right. like I definitely became more of a night owl because of New York too just because it is the nightlife is very yeah. like prominent in New York yeah. and it's, I love it for that but God, I always yeah. I always say in comparison so, with like LA like LA is great for what LA is but I think like New York it's a place of opportunity that if you work hard enough New York will always open a door of opportunity for right. you it's a very grind hustle city like you never see people like flashing their cars flashing this flashing that it's a very like it's grind mode you know the city it's like they don't New York doesn't it doesn't care how much money you have as where you come you from it in, yeah, it's it's like it it's I, that's why I love New York because I feel like yeah. you have to really work hard if you want to live in New York you work you earn it you yeah. earn to live there and like compared to LA flashy how many yeah. followers do you have what kind of car do you drive yeah. where do you live like it's very fake and surfacey and yes there's like definitely fakeness in New York too but I think it's Everyone. very yeah. real Everyone yeah it's sure. very like grounded and it always like motivates because yeah. if you don't if you don't work hard there you you'll be able to survive yeah, like they'll yeah. kick you out and the thing is you it's know? expensive like you gotta yeah. have to want to make it it costs yeah. 50 dollars to go outside and breathe <laughs> like, literally with tax don't forget to tax yeah tax. right <laughs> I think your tax it, it is can, crazy it can definitely be exhausting but like i said you got to compartmentalize it and i think it's more exhausting when people come and visit because they like i mentioned before we got started you know you're trying to fit all of this stuff to do in five days three days whatever yeah, it is that yeah, you're there right. So like to truly be able to experience New York, it takes a couple times to visit it. But living there, you're able to, you know, take, okay, this is what I have to do for work. This is what I have to do for myself. This is what I want to do with other people. And have those resets where mm -hmm. we're able to come back home to Cleveland and settle down and pay a normal And like prioritize for, and remember yeah. like, okay, hey, this is how Absolutely. I need to yeah. organize everything. Right, yeah. But it's good because you, you kind of, like I've caught myself since I've moved there, you know, you kind of, forget what life is outside of New York when you're caught and consumed inside New York and you know the accessibility of hopping in a car and driving somewhere instead of like okay well now I have to take the train I have to do this I have to do that so it is a, it is very good to refresh and reset by leaving every now and then but once you're there for a while you're able to get into a, a routine and stuff so yeah yeah that's great I like the yeah. zeal to have both you know you want the zeal to refresh reset Right. rejuvenate and then you want the zeal to get back into it and yeah. feel the energy and experience yeah. that again too definitely guys I have to ask you too like you both throughout your endeavors up to this point have kind of had like a manager mm -hmm. or someone that's kind of helping you along the way yeah. with that what is that like what's it like being managed by someone but also managing a manager yeah <laughs> uh, it's definitely interesting um, and I was always joking around when it first started uh, with my family, like, oh, let me call my people, you know, let me, call my people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me see, let me see what my people are saying. But I, like, you hear horror stories about it, and you hear good things about it. I, luckily, like I said, I had a team that I was really looking for a family feel. Like, I came from football, I came from all this camaraderie. Um, I wanted that into it in an industry that it's not prevalent in a lot of cases. Yeah. But I've been so blessed. I my manager that first scouted me has been with me since always uh told me hey this is the plan this is how we're going to get there and stuff like that um and a team with my agencies that are really working for me so there's been ups and downs for sure but there i've had a team that i'm lucky enough that has always been looking for my best uh image or my the best for me in my career and put me in positions where hey this is why we're doing this job to get us to here and stuff like that so 
there's some jobs that have come across the table that I've received from brands and stuff like that, but um, they taught me early on, like usually if they know your sign, they're gonna come to your agents if it's a respectable job and, and they're not trying to get away with something, you yeah. know, because when nice. people reach out to you individually, now it's different with like influencing jobs and collaborations like that. That's more, I handle that myself, but with um, editorial shoots, with magazines, campaigns, e-com shoots, like all these different shoots are usually channeled through my agents. And they have said no for jobs. And I'm like, look, I can use this money, man. <laughs> like I can yeah. use this job for this paycheck. Like what's what's the deal here? And they're like, look, that's not, if you, if you take this job, it might prevent you from taking X, Y, and Z that follows. Nice. So there's been some instances where I might not understand in the immediate yeah. why we're not accepting this job or doing this job. Um, but then thankfully I have a team that, well, it makes sense in the aftermath, you know? And yeah, you're able to explain it, it to you. Yeah, yeah. Just leaving the dark, that would stink. Yeah, because yeah, I, I, I know some peers in the industry that <clears throat> they don't have a good team. And, uh, you know, I feel for them. And I like, I tell them, like, look, I got lucky with my, my team because they really look out for me. They know who I am. They're personable with me. Um, and they always put me in the right position, you know? But there's all also, like in every industry, there's people that aren't in it for the right reasons or they're trying to manage their people in different directions and might go against your look or what you're trying to brand yourself. Um, like at first they were trying to paint a picture of this perfect like all American guy, like it does everything right, does every, like doesn't go outside the box in any way or form. And I'm a lot more creative and more have a bigger personality than just yeah. this, you know. So at, in the first couple of years, I'd be uh, showing up to some of these jobs with clients that maybe expected me to behave a certain way. And that's not what they got from me, you know. It wasn't this structured, strict, like, yeah. person. They're, okay, he's got more personality and stuff like that. So that was self-take for me to learn how to deal with different clients and move that way. Um, and they helped me give me advice during that and like I was mentioning earlier with you don't want to give them your full self you don't want to give them too little that they don't care to get to know you better but you want to give them just enough to intrigue them to bring you back for a job yeah, and exactly. how to like uh, navigate those waters in the industry and stuff like that so it is definitely interesting having a dynamic that you have people whose job is to work for you but it's also you're kind of working with them for them for yourself at the same time yeah it seems really dichotomous but also like a nice blend but yeah in your case like a nice blend you do hear the horror story like a nice blend where mm -hmm. you're working to really raise right. each other up. yeah we're both trying to make yeah yeah. Here, yeah. You know? yeah so that's true but what do you think Michelle? Um, I think that it's like also like I was saying earlier like going in mind that they work for you at the end of the day yeah. and you have to sometimes really vouch for yourself and really be able to say like no this is what I want to do this is my goal like yes like they're in the industry and they're good at their job and what they do but sometimes you really have to advocate for yourself sometimes because mm -hmm. sometimes like you no one knows you better than yourself you know what so you true. really want so yeah. sometimes like you know what you think like right now like my agency wants me to cut my hair like really short like probably to here and it's right. also like trusting because like right now the industry a lot of like big clients because they're pushing me into very elegant high fashion so like fendi louis vuitton dior like really those types of brands those companies are booking girls with like really short hair but like a lot of like you know even shows that i see those same shows they're still girls with hair like that are my length yeah so it's like do I really want to cut my hair and listen to my agents because it's like what they think is would help me book jobs or should I still like be myself and do what I'm happy and what makes me feel like the best and like feel beautiful it's like taking that risk and that chance and like I've also never cut my hair that short before and so like a lot of people yeah. are like you're gonna look amazing because you have the type of face structure for it and I it's like trusting them and believing to them too because they do want your best interests and they want you to book the jobs and it's also just like taking a leap of faith and just mm -hmm. doing it instead of just like, oh, well, what if, you yeah. know, because you never know, like you could, you could get it done and you could end up booking all of these things. Right. Yeah. And then like with other things, you just have to also trust yourself and know that, you know, you are good enough to book these jobs, whether or not you cut your hair or right. not, you know, it's having that 
and confidence. It's a, yeah, it's a balance of knowing too that they don't have all the answers. You know, they might give yeah. you advice and stuff like this and say, well, hey, I think right this way. is gonna work and it could or it could not. And a lot of peers I've spoken to where it doesn't pan out the way that their agents recommended them to, they get all frustrated like, oh, I need a new agency, I need a new this. And it's like, no, it's because it's a, an ever adapting industry, you know, like, Something that's working on Monday might not be it on Tuesday, but you might yeah. see them on Tuesday, and if it was yesterday, it may have worked, yeah. you know? So it's like, kind of, we're getting on that same page where it's the confidence and belief in each other, because I told them too, I had a conversation with my team, I was like, look, this is who I am, this is my personality, you know, and I know there's a balance that they're trying to have this image for me that they're pushing, and there's an image that I agree with that I want to push, but I also have this much to offer as well, you know? So yeah. it's definitely that self-belief, but understanding that we might both think this is going to work, and it ends and up not working. Not. Yeah. Or you might think it's working, I don't, and then it ends up working, you know? Or, or it may so just work for someone else, but it doesn't mean it'll work for you. Like, you right. know, there's also a girl in my agency, they had her cut her hair into a pixie cut and dye blonde and she's booking all these major shows and campaigns oh, yeah. that she didn't before just from a haircut you yeah. know so it's like that could work for her but it may not work for me maybe it could work for me that could really open the door for me to book all of this new thing so it's really up to me at the end of the day but also trusting that like my agencies my agents do want me because they, they see my potential and they and I have expressed like what what are my goals and like who I want to walk for and people tell me like oh you could easily walk for these big shows and stuff like that and it's just like well you know yeah. yeah like I'm so like waiting you know yeah. but it's also a lot of it is have to do with just like trusting yourself and I think like recently because I've also got into the pageant world as well and I think sometimes if you try too hard and if you want it too like much it ends up like doing reverse opposite for you instead of just letting it happen. Yeah. And cause I always like, why are the people who always get it? I seem like they don't want it at all. You know, okay. you yeah. always see the people who, not like they don't try hard or doesn't mean you, cause you never know what they do behind the it scenes. Mean, like, but so, if you really try to show too much or you really force it, I think it's almost like the universe pushes against it. It's like- yeah, It's like a desperation. Yeah, it's like a yeah, manifestation yeah. like, oh, you don't want a bad haircut it's really saying you do want a bad haircut in a way you know it's like right. opposite and it's kind of it's like the cliche saying if it's meant to be it's gonna happen for you the way it's supposed to happen and timing is truly everything you may not understand it like heading forward but then when you look backwards you'll be like okay i get why i didn't book it then or i didn't do this or do that or i maybe just not ready for it so it's why just, you came in uh came in as a supposed safety and wasn't a safety right, right. why you got hurt right, right. Yeah. it's crazy and that's why yeah it's i was gonna timing. make that point too that during that time, it <clears throat> allowed me to learn, and I taught myself that I can't put all this faith in somebody that if they're telling me this is their plan for me, you know, like, I still gotta believe in myself and what I see for myself and who I am day to day, what I have to offer and bet on that, whether we have this play, play script for you that it's gonna go this way if you do X, Y, Z, yeah. you know, and just allowing things to happen naturally, but that self-belief of in the back of your head keep pushing you and pushing you towards, yeah, this is yeah. this is gonna work. That's awesome, you guys. Yeah, I think you both, it seems like, have good dynamics with it. Mm -hmm. And kind of to that point, too, we, we talked about this a little bit when we were uh, shooting the breeze while we were setting up. Like, it makes sense to me that models who are an actor and an actress, like, have real busy schedules, but, like, find each other. To me, like, I don't know how it would work if you were with someone say from Cleveland, who's got a little bit of a slower pace of life, where like you guys are slammed, you have book to book, yeah. and have people in your world that are working for you and also helping you with that schedule, like you both are gonna understand that at a level that allows you to mesh, yeah. as opposed to someone, like, take myself, right? I, mean, I hope I get it, but at the same time, right. like, like that's not my life, right? It's a different lifestyle. Yeah. So it yeah. always makes sense to me, I'm kind of dumbfounded that people are bewildered, like, well, it's like, well, why do they always all, like, why do people that are in the industry always end up together? It's like, because they get it. Yeah, yeah. Same, it only makes sense. Yeah. Same with ballet world. A lot of people in the ballet industry all, in the company all day end up dating each other. Because like it makes sense. Yeah, no one really yeah. understand. Like sometimes it, or you work, you marry or date someone who's in like in a different company because it's like you just get it. You just understand. Yeah. You go home. You talk about it. Like it's very rare that I like would see people in the bat, especially in the ballet world, be married to someone who is not part of the industry. Or even if someone was someone that was different, they had a similar type of schedule where it was crazy and that they were able to still relate in some way. But I mean, it's so crazy because me and Mason have talked about it. Like before I met Mason, like my ex was also in the industry. And I'm like, I'm 
not dating another male model. Like, no way, that's never gonna happen. Like, yeah. I so also, I, I was the same thing though. Yeah. I, was, I was never gonna date. A girl and I was like, like either. I was on the whole like athlete run for like a while, like being in Europe and coming back. Like, I wasn't trying to date another model. Like, I yeah. was not trying to do that. It's so funny. And yeah. and then it was like again when I was talking about if you try so hard to want something, it almost like takes longer for it to happen. And I remember right when I was like living in London and I was about to come back, I was like, you know what? Because I, I am such a relationship person at the end of the day, like having fun, having flings, it's all fun and all and fun and dandy. But like I always dreamt of like creating and building something with someone and creating memories with someone and having that and that communication, building that, you know, strong bond that no one can like take away. And I finally told myself, you know, what, I'm just gonna like let go and just like when it happens, it's gonna happen. I genuinely said like I just don't care anymore. Like I just don't care. Yeah. Like I'm still gonna be my best self and not just like do whatever. And then that next week, I met Mason. Yeah. Like it was crazy. Like <laughs> obviously, it doesn't say like it's always gonna happen that quickly right. with everything else in life. Yeah. But it was just like super interesting. Like that was kind of the first time I really truly just like let go. Mm -hmm. And everyone says, oh, it's gonna happen. Actually, it's supposed to happen. And people tell, would tell me that I'm dating. I'm just like. Like there's definitely pros of being in the same industry dating, but I know a few people that have dated outside the industry as well. Some of them worked, some of them definitely did not work. Yeah, yeah. Like, I have one friend um, was in a relationship, and their significant other, uh, I'm pretty sure, was a teacher actually too, and it was like completely two different worlds. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. like the scheduling, and she was ready thinking of what we were talking about earlier like went to school got the job now let's get married you know and he's in a situation where he doesn't have that in his near future and time frame so it made it difficult of understanding like just speaking with him uh of like different jobs that he would have with females or sure. males and stuff like that so it definitely has pros of understanding what we both deal with and the scheduling for sure because it could be feast or famine you know yeah. like some months you could be working three four times a week yeah. then some months you could have one job a month you know yeah. or like two jobs a month so it allows yeah. you know that understanding of hey it's hot right now it's not okay we right. have a lot of downtime right now what what can we do to stay proactive you know and yeah. being able to motivate each other and keep pushing like hey even if it's not hitting right now we're still moving forward we're That's still right. going yeah. in the right yeah. direction I think the best part is growing, like seeing the growth mm -hmm. and seeing when like we book something and being able to celebrate that with each other and be supportive. Right. I think it's just like it's cool to see the journey, like yeah. being in the same industry too, and understanding in that sense. Because like I said, I've dated people like one of my exes who was a professional athlete was like didn't understand. I'm like, well, how would you feel if I booked a campaign and I had to make out with someone? He's like, well, then don't take the job. Like, don't take <laughs> the job. Like, literally would tell me that. He's like, then I don't think we could work out. If you're, I'm like that's part of work like what do you yeah. mean like that's even it's even worse with acting if you have certain scenes and yeah it was just like it you know yeah. again it works sometimes we it both have, doesn't we both have had jobs where we've had to do that yeah, yeah. 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 it's like yeah that's what happens yeah but it's still in the back of your head it's natural thinking about it and like not wanting it essentially you know like but then it's a the ability to compartmentalize it and be like look yeah. like it is just it work, work. Like, it means nothing like it's it right yeah, yeah. And yeah, also, if someone's really going to leave because they just made out with someone and they weren't meant for you then, then it really yeah. was never meant to be. If yeah. someone's going to leave based off that they just had a romantic scene on yeah. set, it's like, okay, then right. I don't want the person anyways if you're going to... Yeah, the best thing about it is, like, you're acting. It's in the name where you're yeah. modeling. Yeah. yeah. Like, it's not, yeah. It's not authentic. Yeah. Take like, it I mean, it is. So I don't mean, you know what no, I mean? No, but like, we understand. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. The whole idea is that you're playing a part of your building like, right. an image. Exactly. Right. Like, exactly. That's just interesting. I kind of have two questions for you with that. The first one's simple. Have you guys done anything together? Like, have you done any, have you had that opportunity yet? We had some small shoots. It wasn't for a job. It was more a uh, test shoot, which is kind of to develop the skill or whatever. But everyone but, tells us, like, you guys should do a shoot. Yeah. Shoot. And we did do a shoot um, with one of my friends. Like I said, it was like more of a workshop, and we did, like, Moschino campaign-style type shoot. And Moschino right. cool. actually posted the wow. photo of us yeah. on their Instagram. Which is really which cool. Which is a, uh, Moschino is a high fashion brand uh, from Italy that I've had the pleasure of working with for a few years now. They're very big. And, yeah. It was really cool. Like, it's also challenging too because it would be different if we were assigned to the same agent. Like then we okay. might be pushed more so together as a collective. But it's then, harder. Yeah, we have two different teams agents. working for us and it's like, uh, and sometimes in the industry, you know, relationships aren't 
the greatest thing for agents when they hear this, you know, but it's also respectful and understanding your own happiness and building yourself as your own image and stuff like that. But it doesn't happen all the time just because, oh, they're dating their models, let's book them together. Yeah. It, it's rare, but we're hoping, we're hoping one day. Same with like acting. Soon. That's what's gonna act, 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 Acting, like you never see really like, it was different, like Angel, An Angelina Jolie and like Brad Pitt, they were like a different story. Like you would see them in a couple movies and they Crash were like, and yeah, yeah but like a lot of directors like don't actually book married couples who are like successful actors together because they want the more authenticity of like people who don't know each other and building that instead of people who are already together and they're used to that you know that love yeah, instead of just story. like Im imagining with someone with someone new to create that magic on camera compared right. to like someone who's already together but like the honeymoon love is something that's different i don't know but right. it's very rare even in that scene like very big actors who are already together aren't we usually booked together for like a scene i feel like that makes sense because like a couple's gonna have their own identity as a unit, and so that's either going to fit the mold of right. what the acting world is, right? And what wants the or what role they is, yeah. Right. That's another reason too. But sometimes, depending if the role like you're saying, if the role is fit for that, then they would book like yeah. a couple. Then I feel like that makes sense too. Yeah. And then, so then the second part, which is a little more complex, and we kind of threw this out like there too a little bit. What does like practice look like? So you said like when it's feast or famine. So during the times that it's slower and you're working towards that progress, what does like practice look like like yeah. obviously the football has a lot of practice the ballet has a lot of practice mm -hmm. now what does it look like for a model because it's a lot of yeah. that football and ballet it's a lot of structured practice sure you know, yeah you're expecting what you're going in that day to do right yeah. and one of the biggest uh learning points coming from the football world to the modeling industry and everything like that was i was used to you know some coaches mother f you to get on the line until you do it right like screaming like intense intense until you get it right do it again do it again you know and then in the modeling world whether you're doing it right you know people are like oh beautiful amazing like this is great awesome and then you can leave and they'll be like what the hell is that guy doing you yeah. know or like what was that <laughs> and you don't know until later you hear back from your agents whether it was good or bad and sometimes they don't even hear mm -hmm. so it was a lot of okay self-tape self-critique like read off the person, oh, nice. the client, like yeah. how are they reacting to this, you know? And like a trick I would use is, okay, if we're doing the poses this way, that way, in the beginning, in between the shoots, okay, maybe I'll dance a little bit or I'll like move my body a certain way where they might catch it off to the side and be like, oh yeah, do that for this now. And so I'm able to like push the boundary with some clients and warm up with them and being like, uh, or being able to show them okay I can move this way or I can move that way um, one of the big things that helps me a lot and I was telling her too because she used to give me a hard time about it in our beginning of our relationship of how much I would look in the mirror you know and it like of course seems narcissistic and self-absorbing but to truly know um, what you're giving off in different angles or different looks and stuff like that and able to work on your expressions in the camera or in the mirror uh, can portray through the camera so yeah, it's a lot of yeah. like okay let me just have an hour and dance in front of the mirror or like look right. in the mirror in different angles and different poses and stuff like that so it's a a lot of a lot of self-tape and self-critique and yeah. trial and error okay this might work mm, didn't work for them but it may have worked for a different client you know yeah i think it's a lot awesome. of people that don't think of that i like to do as far as like preparation is more like the mental side of it like not just the physical aspect right. of like your pose like of course, there's the basics, like knowing your angles, knowing your body. It's really all about knowing your body and how, what pose, what you do, like Tom Ford. He never shows one side of his face because he knows this is whatever side is the best side. So you'll never, ever catch him in a picture showing his non-good side of his face. Like he said this in the interview. Wow, okay. He's like, you'll never see my other side of his face. It's like you just knowing yourself and knowing how you, like sometimes also if you're new, like going up, sometimes you have to show like certain sides that if the director wants you to do this pose and you know that's maybe not the best side of your face, you still have to learn how to do the best angle that you think your body is going to give off, even if it's not the best side of your face, yeah. you know? Um, but for me especially, I think the mental aspect, because you have to have like very mentally, like you have to have thick skin and thick skull, yeah. like in ballet and same with like football or any athletic career. But with modeling, because you hear a thousand no's really before you hear like the one yes, I could change your career. And for me, like personally, like I'm still waiting for like the one yes, I would change my career because I'm still like 
fairly new in the industry because I didn't take modeling as seriously once I got signed and then I was traveling a lot and that was kind of like my focus is traveling and touring which I'm like very grateful I did have that yeah. time in my life because I really saw so much of like the world and I got to experience a lot and that also made me like different mentally in the way I view things and stuff but I think just like again knowing yourself and knowing who you are and not let so many things get to you naturally with like how people may want something because again like you could go into a casting and you get the best like I've had the best feedback the best responses don't hear anything yeah. some of the ones I try the least for kind of like oh like oh if I get it if I get it call back books of course. you know yeah, of course. like I said yeah. the same like from before when I said it, when yeah. you try super hard because you know like oh this is for like a cover girl campaign you know and it's like I wanted it so bad like I have the closest bookings the ones that I either crashed the casting I never even got the casting or I didn't care like my my favorite story was because you're not really supposed to do it in modeling but I was with my one of my best friends in the industry and she got cast she got a casting for a L'Oreal hair campaign and I was just like with her because we were hanging out having coffee and she was like, you should actually come with me and just crash it because your hair is amazing and they would love to book you. I feel like you get booked for this. And I'm like, yeah, but I don't know because you're not really supposed to do that, whatever. And usually when it comes to campaign castings, there's like a list that yeah, they have yeah. everyone's name, who the agency, because it's specifically, because campaigns are the biggest jobs you can book, especially in like hair, like commercial jobs or beauty jobs. It's like 20 to like 50, 60 racks that you book for like a two day job. So I was like, okay, I'll just go and see, whatever. So I was like, I walk in, like, oh, like, name, name, see. It's like, oh, my name's Rochelle, but my agent just sent me on this, like, this casting. So, like, I, I don't have my comp card or anything. Like, I might not be on the list. So, like, she's like, okay, okay, come in, come in. So, and this was, like, three years ago. So I, I wasn't with the same agency when I did this. Um, but I sit down, and they're taking pictures. And, again, like, I'm going, I'm just, like, nonchalant. Because I'm like, I didn't even get this casting. I'm yeah. not, probably not going to get it. I go in, they're taking photos, and they think I'd be perfect fit for this style of hair. The next, I told my agency that day, that same day, like, hey, like, I actually crashed this L'Oreal hair camping cast, so if you hear something from them, that's what, that's why, you know? And they're like, okay. Next day, my agent, hey, you just got a call back. Can you go to their headquarters, da, da, da. And I'm like, really? And I'm like, and my friend who actually got casting didn't get a call back. Oh my God. So then I go in, and I, they're like, the main guy who's directing is like, oh my gosh, feeling my hair, love your texture, it's amazing, like, I can see this, da, 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 da. And then I tell them, my agent, whatever, and the next day they're like, oh, you got an official, like the last call back casting. So now it was just between me and one other girl to get booked for this job. And I was like, what's going on? I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so crazy. And, and they, you know, they didn't choose me, but I was like, I was picked like the last yeah. person with just one other girl. It was between out of like, 100 200 girls and they saw and i never even got the job yeah, right. but it was like that same mentality that i feel like if i just go and being myself and if it happens it happens instead of like oh because i know it's going to be a campaign or it's a job i want to i need to be more like this or that and really showcase and show off whatever and so i think that's something i like to look back with mentality wise yeah. that like if it's meant for you and it's supposed to happen it's going to happen like still put your best face forward and right. best foot forward and not like overthink every little thing and just right. do it and walk out and know you gave everything that you yeah. could and just let it happen the way it's supposed to yeah. so the, mental, the, yeah, mental, the mental side mental is like i think the most huge. work process especially when it comes to slow season you know because the season of modeling is right. very up and down and so. being able to maintain like a level head through the yeses and nos because sometimes even when you get those yeses it doesn't pan out the way either the client wants it or you expected it to be too and um because a lot of your looks come through your eyes and you can see the emotion and passion in the eyes through the pictures that are taken and being able to maintain that mental allows you to portray it through your eyes and it can be challenging at times for sure but always understanding the self-confidence and the self-worth of okay i'm here for a reason i'm in the room i'm trying to get at the table okay i'm yeah. at the table i'm trying to eat you yeah know? yeah and just like believing in yourself yeah really, you know? definitely that's amazing mm -hmm. yeah could you guys have like some shoots that stand out that are like some of your favorites like that's an awesome story where mm -hmm. yeah that was like that was great yeah. yeah yeah um i've had some pretty great shoots uh i was mentioning you know the important shoots to me not necessarily are my biggest shoots that I've done yeah. um, 
but some of them that mean a lot that are full circle, you know, like working with Tom Brady's brand and it coming full circle because, okay, I have the football history and then I'm doing this and the people from the football world are going to recognize this job or working for Express, being able to come to Columbus, being from Ohio. And this was the first job that put me in the stores of actuality where people are able to see like, okay, he is modeling, you know, because like, there's so much that goes, yeah, there's so much that goes into the modeling world that isn't seen to the average person or somebody that's not in the industry that knows. And uh, so those were special moments. And then being able to fly to Columbia for three days and doing a shoot in Columbia was awesome. Yeah. That I did last February and it wasn't the biggest job or anything like that, but I got flown to Columbia to work, right. you know? Um, one of my favorite jobs I did was this runway show I walked for Philip Line and it was one of my first jobs into the industry too and it was kind of like, this is what it can be, and Philip Line is known to have these elaborate parties for his fashion shows and stuff, and he had this huge warehouse uh, rented out, and on the ground there's all this fake snow over the entire warehouse floor, and these big uh, metal built mountain looking scapes, and in the on the ceiling there was a UFO that had stretched the entire uh, length wow. of the warehouse pretty much yeah. so the, U yeah, the UFO came down <coughs> and left the DJ stage through the base of it and then the UFO would go back up and the DJ stage stayed and there was a robot probably a six, six foot five robot that walked the runway with us you know and, it's like, um, yeah. Migos performed at this show like all yeah. these all these things happened and it was one of the first it was the second night actually I moved there when I officially moved there wow. and it was the second night and I'm walking and I'm like well, okay here we go you know <laughs> and that was a pretty special moment you yeah. know being able to work on a few campaigns here and there has definitely been special yeah have you guys been able to backlog to any places where you were together before you knew each other uh, no, the only time was supposed to be this party that yeah. she was hosting Yeah, mm -hmm. a year before uh, we ended up meeting. And that same mutual friend was inviting me to the party. And for whatever reason, I didn't go. Yeah. And we both said uh, we both said that we were thankful because we were both in the position, definitely, that we were like, no, like we're not looking for a significant other or anything like that. Yeah. We definitely would have hit it off if we met that night. And then shortly after that party, she was moving to Europe. And yeah. It allowed that natural time for when we did meet. Again, we weren't looking for a significant other, but it just clicked like it did. And yeah. that was the only time that our paths would have yeah. crossed before. I think it's crazy when people can like backlog to like, oh, we were in the same place at this time. And like, right. didn't know yeah. each other and then like fast forward. I mean, we probably yeah. were, I'm sure, yeah. like maybe at an event or something, just didn't realize it. But yeah. 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 Possibly. Who are some of like your biggest influences? Like, whether it's like, whether you know them, like, Mom, you right. um, both your parents or mm -hmm. your mom, yeah. you know, like having maybe it's someone in media that you know, or who are some like on a bigger scale. Yeah. Well, I, sure. I feel like everyone always like laughs at me when I say this person, but I'd have to say The Rock, like okay. Dwayne Johnson, is like my biggest like inspiration because okay. he's like my biggest also like person I would love to work with, like on a movie or set, or even if he directs, like I just love to meet him, work with him. Um, because it's like his story like he literally came from nothing like at all he like his famous story of seven dollars in his pocket you know like I didn't come from a lot of money either you know I it was just me and my mom like my mom raised me she was my mom and my dad you know played both parts I did, I don't have any siblings and so I you know she worked from the ground up too and it's just like just because you know sometimes like you're not maybe given the same opportunities like you know you see people who come from the families who are already like well developed you know in the modeling industry and acting and it's so much easier on their path because they have those easy opportunities to be given to them yeah. to like do something it's like oh like sometimes you feel like it's not fair because you feel like oh like you feel like you could do this a little better or whatever you get the kind of that sure. like mentality like you get stuck in your head and then I feel like just with the rock and who he is and he had the same similar story with going to football his dream was to play in the NFL and he got cut like he wasn't like in the story he wasn't good enough he couldn't play but that was like his biggest dream and he said if he didn't get cut he would not be where he is today and got into acting and all that he did and um and 
he said Ed, like he had the same story you know everything happens for a reason and you have to trust your time and not also look at your age as something that like holds you back because yeah, of the industry we fine. live in and that like oh if you're this age if you're 25 26 you should already be here because it's so easy to compare your age to someone else who's already like 10 times ahead of you that you sure. feel like where you should be because you're the same age as them and it makes you feel like it can hold you back because like there's no one that can hold you back than yourself and it's like well you feel like you can't try as hard because like well I should already be there so like I'm embarrassed to like keep trying to yeah. do this because like I should already be there or something like that yeah. and just like again him coming from literally nothing how humble he is and modest like he drives a pickup truck like he gives back like he's very real and open and yeah he's like a goofball and stuff yeah. but his story and like who he is like he never like changed and like he, he always said he would go back home to remember like where he came from awesome. that he literally yeah. came from zero and that you know he's a multi multi-millionaire that like it never changed him like the money like the amount of zeros that were attached to his name right. you know like and that's like my biggest goal like in that in life is just be able to inspire millions hundreds of thousands of people and same with kobe like kobe is like another big oh, inspiration God, yeah. for me right. and how like when he passed away like you, you don't remember like how many cars he had like how much money he had or like the clothes this and that you just remember the impact like i remember when he died like i cried myself to sleep like four nights straight i never met the guy i never even went to a game of his like i would see him on tv and stuff sure. but, like because of his impact and who he was as like a person like affected me so much i was like wow like he literally like the world like was silent for yeah, like yeah, a long yeah. time and it's like Definitely. having that much impact like shows his character and i think for me like hoping like i get you know that acclimated in life and that successful that i still could have that same impact and not be changed because obviously i know i'm sure like he was tested too like when you give all the fame the, the energy the photographers like you definitely have those moments where you kind of feel you're like a little like this but like going back to like your basics and remember like who you are and not changing that so i think in this industry too because it's like a black hole and you can easily get sucked in right. and when you're around all these famous people the drinking the whatever the cars the clothes yeah. like it's very easy to like lose sight of why you're doing it yeah. and what's the main like purpose and his famous quote like how he defines success is being able to inspire others to want to inspire the next generation so like cool. that's yeah. what like success yeah. for him is to find not because like he always said the job is never done even though right. he was like Right. MVP, this, that, one, right. everything, you know, like he's like, the job's still never done. And it's he's like, like the story from Vanessa when he, he she was speaking in, in at the funeral, and she's like, you know, like he always played, like he, because he never sat, like obviously he had so yeah. many injuries, and like his recovery time was so fast because like he was always yeah. playing. He's always the first in the gym, too. Yeah, first in the gym, last guy to last, leave. Yeah. And he would always play, and his like rationale was like, you know, there's someone that saved up to get their kid to go watch me play. Yeah. 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 And, like that's so sick. Yeah. I mean, yeah. just I that humility that. to talking about. Yeah. Right, it's crazy. Those two are awesome. Yeah, yeah. rock and Kobe. Yeah. God, yeah. But I just love like that amazing. passion because yeah. of course there's so many like famous people and stuff, but it's like the, those are the types of people that right like, really make a difference. Because I really genuinely love helping people and like mm -hmm. and being able to like even if it's like one person like like me, I'm trying like build because I built I have another TikTok account too, and it's like it's obviously so I'm familiar from the ground up again because I'm trying to do different content. But it's like I tell myself that. Even if I help one person or one person sees it every single day yeah. and follows me, that like matters to me mm -hmm. because well, like I'm changing one person or helping them and whatever and like right. trickles. Yeah. Right. So I think that's Domino effect. Yeah. Definitely. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 How about you, Mason? Um, yeah, those are great examples. I definitely share uh influence from those uh two as well. Yeah. I would say I mean definitely my immediate family in the circle of friends I keep around myself, you know, I've always kept my circle small, but everybody plays a role in my life that I keep close with me, you know, so I look for inspiration through, uh, you know, my dad, my mom, my brothers, my sisters, and what they've gone through in life and how do they overcome these adversities and stuff like that, or friends, like, how did they handle a situation like this? And I'm always able to revert back through times of difficulty or struggle and say, okay, how would so-and-so that's close to me how would they think of this and give me a different perspective within my own perspective um just thinking how they handle situations differently um on a larger scale you know people that i haven't met necessarily um i always looked at 
a vast majority of success. Like, okay, what what did this person do to be successful here? What did that person do to find success in their uh, in their journey? And like people that are able to do all sides of the process. Like you look at LeBron James, of course, a big influence for me. He's able to play every position on the floor. He was able to come from absolutely nothing as well, but still provide and be one of arguably the greatest ever, you know? Yeah. And unfortunately, Kanye is going through what he's going through right now. And he's a mad genius. And right now we're seeing the mad side of him. But uh, just again, if you've ever seen his documentary, he was able to control all parts of the process. You know, he's able to do all parts of creating a song, make the beat, add this, add that, and have the lyrics and be able to be all parts of the process is what I valued and, um, and try to reciprocate in my own life. You know, like when I want to make content, okay, well, I want to be able to make the video. I want to be able to edit it. I want to do the sound. Yeah. I want to put it out. I want to be able to model. I don't only want to model fitness high fashion i want to be able to do it all whatever the job is i want to be able to do it so i uh, especially during the nfl process i took styles of gameplay from many different players from d linemen from linebackers to dbs okay how are they successful in their respective positions how can i curate that into my own game so i've always been like we said earlier a sponge you know a sponge of knowledge all right there's not just one way to success there's not just one way to do this how can i take from all these greatness uh all this greatness from all these people and curate it into me and how can i use all these different avenues and advice to curate it for my success so you know some of those people like in the acting industry look up to ryan reynolds you know look up to mark Wahlberg, you know some of the greats obviously and just see their stories their journeys what they went through and just being able to learn from a handful of people and curate your own success story through is definitely where I get a lot of my influence from. Yeah, that's awesome. To be able to take it from people and then just put it into a practice and like yeah. take tidbits from each person and be able to call it into authentic you, I think is always so yeah. impactful and effective. Yeah. Definitely. I think it's so effective. Yeah. Because yeah. I feel like those types of successful people like always have that one thing in common that's like looking at that and how they mm. like remembering where they come from the humility and just like being right. able to help others. Yeah. I think that's like what speaks to people more you know even if like there's people out there who obviously aren't nice people it still does affect those people at the end of the day like even if they don't show off like showcase that they're like grateful or that they act like it doesn't affect them like it still does like yeah. even those types of people that don't like yeah and I always took in advice my dad always gave me was with football was the more you know the more you play the more positions you know the more you're going to be on the field you can be counted on and relied on to do any job that's on the field if you know it and yeah so i look at that and i take those pieces of, all right if i'm if i know how to do this i can do it but what if i want to do this too because i think uh past generations you know I, I think we're truly a golden era and a generation young enough to know what it was before internet and stuff like that right. but old and uh or old enough yeah. to understand before and young enough to get where it's going you know and before you know you would stick you would have to have a specialized skill to be successful in what you want to do. But now you're able to do many things, teach, coach, do a podcast. You're able to take all these different avenues and curate it. And there's not these defining careers you have to do where it's like, okay, well, that's what you do. You're in a box. Why would you do anything else? How could you do anything else? But no, you look at all these people that we've grown up admiring that are able to have different assets and within their life and different skills. And you're able to put that out into your life and yeah. be successful in all these different areas. Dude, humans are so multifaceted. Like, yeah. There's yeah. so much that makes up a person. And yeah. like, that's been my favorite thing about having mm -hmm. guests on here who do stuff and like, are out there and live yeah. it. Everyone's got a story and there's a lot that culminates in right. a human. Right, definitely. Yeah. 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 And knowing like we're all the same, you know? Yeah. Like yeah. we all come from different like parts of life, but we all have, I think, m more in common than I think people like the realize. Yeah. Totally. You know? yeah. Like recognizing like everyone is human. Mm -hmm. you know? Guys, so as we kind of come here to a close and uh, wrap up this episode, which has been amazing, by the way, thank you both. Yes. Do you, do either of you, I'll come to both of you, whoever wants to start, take it, mm -hmm. have advice to someone either in the field who's an aspiring actor, actress, model, ballerina, football mm -hmm. player, whatever the case, wherever you want to take it, or just in general, do you have like a piece of advice? Yeah, or? yeah definitely. Um, 
knowledge is power, man. So it's definitely the more people are able to do this. And I think that would, before I get into that, I think that was one of the most difficult things about the pandemic and the separation and costs or developed in between people and that divide amongst everybody. You know, like everybody was scared to see each other and it got people to stop sharing stories and communicating and stuff. So with the knowledge being power, you know, something I was always told was, uh, especially from my mom, whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're right. So your mind is your most powerful weapon. And if you have the self-belief and you truly believe that you're able to do something, you keep working at it, you keep working at it, eventually it will come into fruition, you know? And if it doesn't come into full fruition, uh, what you're expecting, you're still, how much can you learn from all of this different milestones of trying to accomplish something you're able to learn lessons throughout the process i go back to that four-year mindset you know okay i might get to where i want to go by the third year i might be short by the fourth year come up short but i'm still able to learn and grow by taking that risk going after it and uh, whether it is happening right away or not the hardest thing is the voice in the back of your head is this making sense? Yeah. Is this worth it? Is it going to pan out? Instead of focusing on if, it focus on what can, what can we do? What are we doing to get after it? And I always tell my friends too, you know, you're the pilot to your own future. You know, you're able to drive that, that ship wherever you want. And if you decide to keep going, keep going, even if you fall on your face, because you're not going to be able to get that moment twice. When I almost walked away from football in high school, my a head coach, Steve Trevisano, told me, he's like, you're, you're never going to be able to play high school football again on Friday night with your boys. You know, like, you're not going to be able to get this experience back. So whether you're able to come in and start for me, whether you're coming in role player bench, you're never going to be able to experience this moment again. So instead of living life later, shit, I should have yeah. tried doing this, I should have chased after that, we'll do it, even if you fit, you know? Like, even if it ends up coming short, you're still learning and have that experience of trying there's lessons that you can teach people, give advice during failure just as much as during success. Yeah. Those are great words, Mason. They really yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, my biggest, I think, thing that I like to look at, I think even Kobe said this too, or probably, um, uh, what's his name? Washington? Washington? Denzel, Denzel Washington. Yeah. He said, you He's can't, yeah. yeah, you can't succeed in life if you don't fail. And so, you have to look at failure as a positive in a, in a sense, even though it's a negative word, that failure is actually a good thing because it, it just, it, it takes you on a path of success. And, you know, it's not how many times you fall, it's about giving up every single time that you do and to just keep believing in yourself because again, like there's no one that can stop you from reaching your highest point than yourself. And there's taking each moment that you fail and as a learning process and that life is a journey and it's not about the destination it's like the way of life and that every single moment you're given is to help you go into the next and to not focus on the destination it's just that you're here in this moment you're here for a reason and to enjoy it and to just enjoy life and not live in fear of like oh i could be here i could be there and just like take every moment and just live it like it's your last yeah. It's cliche, but oh, it's just yeah, it's like real. just really cliche just real. like yeah. yeah. Because then you can take you you take more risk, and you the more risk you take, the more likely you're able to fail and then succeed, and then that way you can just you can enjoy it and yeah. just live life happy because you know like again with Kobe's passing as well, it's like life is so short, and it's just oh, like yeah. it's really just taking in with COVID and like. COVID didn't teach you anything, like that should teach you that life is too short for with, real, with for the real. pandemic, yeah. that yeah. like get up off your ass and yeah. just like get right. to work and just like go after your dream, you know, just yeah. like keep pushing. If you work a nine to five, keep pushing. If that's like what your your job is, you know, just like keep going after it and just like believe in yourself. Like even when you don't feel like doing anything, just do something, even if it's the littlest bit, right. at least you did something, yeah. you know, yeah. so. And cliches are cliche but they work for a reason because they are I I tell a lot of my friends that you know I talk to them during their times of struggle and my times of struggle and I'm like you have to sometimes trick yourself you know lie lie to your mind you know like your your mind can play tricks on you and and to never go off emotion 
because yeah. if you if you're always led by your emotions, oh, then it's it's gonna set, it's gonna yeah. set you back more. You know, it's like mm -hmm. if you feel lazy, it doesn't mean you have to follow suit by your actions just because you feel lazy right. and feel yes. tired. Like sometimes you have to just do it, and then your mind will then follow. Yes. Just don't let your mind always follow right. for your actions to leave behind. Right. Know? And I always tell them, wake up and say it's another day in paradise. So like a lot of people, every time they see me, that's it. He always says that, another day in paradise. Another day in paradise, because why? It's always 75 and sunny up, up in the mental. Yeah. You know, no yeah. matter what it is, I know today's going to get me to tomorrow. I know whatever I'm doing today, I'm working towards a better tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a good day or a bad day, you know, in the cliche, we don't take L's, we learn yeah. lessons, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like, and, and stop saying like, you're going to do it tomorrow. Just do yeah. it today. Yeah, yeah. we're you guys are amazing. I mean, yeah, I appreciate it. It's just, it's awesome to hear and experience you two like in such a refreshing way. And I appreciate both of you coming too. Yeah, thanks for having yeah. us. Yeah. yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, it's been a wonderful, wonderful episode here. So again, everyone, I'm your host, Joe Clark. I had an amazing opportunity today with both Mason and Rochelle. We appreciate you tuning in. If you haven't yet, it's time to hit the subscribe button. Yes. I don't know what you're waiting on. Um, I will have all their info and kind of a little description on both YouTube and, of course, anywhere you're listening to this podcast, Apple, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you listen to your podcasts. I'll have some sort of contact info for both of them. Um, they're busy people. Give them, if you're reaching out, know that. <laughs> but <laughs> no, I we, always, we always love yeah. people reaching out. Yeah. Just spreading our knowledge, you know, yeah. and yeah. we reach out to people too. Like we reach out and we try to get yeah. knowledge. So that's why I said, you know, the more you know, the more you play. So yeah. we're more alike than we are different. We were just yeah, talking exactly. about this. Right. Yeah. But again, Mason, Rochelle, thank you both. Yeah, I really so do much. appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. It's been another episode of Chats with Clark.